Hi, everybody. Welcome to the WHO Most Awesome Founder podcast, a show about entrepreneurs, innovators, advisors, and educators, and the stories that make them who they are today. I'm your host, Dries Vaans, and today we welcome two professors to the podcast, namely Murat Tarachi. He's a full professor of innovation strategy at RSM Erasmus University, and Timo van Balen, He's an assistant professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at Utrecht University. Now, to avoid that this conversation becomes a boring academic talk between nerdy professors, I'm also very happy to have again as my co-host, Garrett McGowan, who will make sure to keep us on track when discussing the fascinating topic of entrepreneurial communication strategies on which Timo and Murat did some fascinating research. Teresa, Timo I think that's and Murat. the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Thank you. <laughs> Timo and Murat, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. As you might know, we always start with a bit of storytelling. So we give our guests the opportunity to briefly say something about their background, where they're coming from. Uh, Murat, can I give you the floor first to briefly tell us something? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Denise Gareth. Thank you so much for having us today. Uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm Rattarach, as you said, uh, uh, currently full professor at Rotterdam School of Management. I was born in Eastern Anatolia, and my parents migrated 1,500 kilometers to the west uh, of Turkey, and they have been always very proud of me uh, until uh, throughout the school. Then I started working for two years. Then I decided to uh, pursue a PhD degree. They were no longer proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> they criticized me for my decision. They said, oh, you should never do that. Instead, you should keep studying, uh, sorry, keep working and uh, buy a house, do your military service, get kids, and so on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think nowadays we made our peace with them. <laughs> yeah, I think they are now proud again of you, not now that you're a full professor at one of the top schools in Europe, I suppose, that, that gives them some proudness, I think. Uh, Timo, can I also... <laughs> Timo, can I also give you briefly the floor to say something about yourself? Yes, of course. Thank you, Dries. Thank you, uh, uh, Garrett, for having us. Um, so... I'm actually Dutch. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands, in Amstelveen. Actually, born in Amsterdam, raised in Amstelveen. Uh, I, I lived and studied in Amsterdam for a long time. Um, even when I did my PhD uh, uh, studies, um, originally on innovation at Rotterdam School of Management. So okay. as you might guess, Murat is also my former PhD supervisor. Uh, oh, okay. We know each other. Um, and actually, from, from there, um, I, I became actually... You know, I was working on innovation, and I want to highlight this, is that um, there was always this latent interest in entrepreneurship. Um, and that's not a lot of people notice, but I had, a, I had my, own, my own startup in 2011, 12. Uh, it was an online fruits and vegetables startup uh, where we sold like fruits and vegetables you know, through a website and you would get it delivered at your, uh, at your gym or at your uh, child daycare so that we would solve the logistics problem, right? So there was also this sense of a, of a social venture there. Um, and there I, I also saw these challenges that, that, that you as a founder deal with. We never really got the scale. But as I was working in my PhD, I realized that I was maybe even more interested in, in early stage entrepreneurship and how these entrepreneurs mobilize their resources um, and particularly maybe resources for complex challenges like uh, it, solving social issues or environmental issues uh, uh, and how they go about interacting with their environment. So I, I think that's sort of in short my journey. Uh, but after my PhD, and that's the final thing I want to highlight, um, um, I actually also worked for a startup for one and a okay. half years as a head of operations. Uh, this was not a social startup or anything, um, but it was a lot of fun. And then um, when that ended, as that ends with startups because money runs out, I, uh, I came back to academia after doing some soul searching. Yeah. Can That's I briefly ask story. then a question about that? Hey, I think. Yeah, of course. So, um, why after the PhD going into a startup? That seems to be quite an unusual trajectory, I would say, especially in the Netherlands, where PhDs are very academic, uh, focused on academics. 
So I have rarely heard an, a, a Dutch PhD student then going into a startup. Can you explain a bit why you want to do that? Were you so fed up yeah. with Murat and his supervision that you needed something different? Murat, uh, well thought. Murat well thought. is uh, nice to work with, uh, but uh, also challenging. No, I mean, okay. for jokes aside, I, I think all of you that that, that did it, I mean, you. I think you all did a PhD or are doing a PhD and you know how challenging it can be. And I think at some point I, I also struggled with the, the motivational side of it. Uh, and because, like you said, especially in the Netherlands where or in Europe, where PhDs often go from bachelor's to master's of science and then they suddenly land a PhD position, I had no real practical experience in business side. And some part of me had always seen myself there. Uh, and so I thought, why not practice what I preach? I'm so interested in entrepreneurship, small teams. I, I like the autonomy. Let's give it a shot and, 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 and try it out. Uh, I, I did on purpose keep a foot in the door. So I was a part-time teacher, okay. lecturer one day a week, still at Rotterdam School of Management, because in the back of my mind, I knew there is always this path that I might still want to take, and I want to keep that door open. Cool. Great. Okay, then um, let's actually delve into the paper for which we actually invited you to talk. Um, so you two guys recently published a paper um, uh, with the title Recruiting Talent Through Entrepreneurs' Social Vision Communication. And it was published in Organization Science. Now, uh, maybe for our audience, that's one of the really the top journals in the world on management. So that's quite an accomplishment. And I actually thought it would be very interesting to discuss this paper in the podcast because it touches upon a number of topics that we quite often discuss in the podcast. So, of course, it's a paper about entrepreneurs, but it's also a paper about social ventures and it's a paper about communication strategies of startups. And I think, Garrett, I think you can agree with me. These are topics that often come up in our podcast, in our inspiration sessions. So it was actually nice to see a paper that brought three of these topics together. So therefore, I wanted to have you here on the podcast to go a bit deeper into the papers, not only in the academic part, but then also discuss a bit about what can we actually learn from it uh, for entrepreneurs. Now, maybe as a starting point, um, and typically when we talk with entrepreneurs, we always ask them, uh, how did you come up with the idea for your startup? So I would actually ask you a similar question. How did you come up with the idea for this paper? Uh do, do you want to go to more? Should I go? I so honestly, I was um, I was the end of my PhD, and uh, I still had to come up with another project, right? Um, <laughs> and I got thinking what 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 struck me as the the key thing that I found interesting about the the, the project that I did before, which was uh, on um, uh, more disruptive vision communication and how investors respond to that. And then I I I came to thinking, hey, it's about how how particular audiences that that have a resource that these entrepreneurs need, how they how they respond to that communication, how do they interact with it? And um, then I got thinking, what is what is currently yeah. happening around me? And I, I noticed that there's a lot of startups that are yeah. increasingly uh, trying to tackle social uh, challenges. Uh, nowadays, it even seems that most ventures, it is an exception if you're not trying to tackle a social challenge, but it still differs how much they actually emphasize this in their recruitment. And it, it, it seems that it differs in much in the extent to which they emphasize this as a core attribute of, of their organization towards these job seekers. Uh, and, and that was just for me the, the, the start. It's like, hey, what does this, again, what does this mean? What does this look like? Uh, yeah, how, how can we make sense of this? And I think that's when we got to talk about it and how this would work. Do you want to add to that, yeah. Uh, yes, actually, we, uh, we got the idea from a, a sitcom called Silicon Valley. <laughs> yes, yeah. sp specific idea. I would be happy to share the excerpt uh, with you. But before we go there, it's part of a larger research program. I want to quote with a fellow uh, colleague here, Ethan Molek. He put it very nicely. He says that in the beginning, a startup is just words. You need to convince employees to join you on a journey mm -hmm. before the journey even begins. Uh, and it's not only for the employees, but also for investors and all the other resources that you need made us to think that actually uh, for startups, vision communication plays a cl critical role. So this is part of a research program that Timo and I have been investigating. Uh, we published uh, two papers on this. One, one paper was accepted by you, there is and uh, that uh, appeared in this uh, podcast before. 
And the other one is going back to the uh, Silicon Valley uh, uh, TV show. There, there were uh, enact, reenacting the demo day of disrupt a tech tech disruption. And there, so we we, told, we noticed that the it's of course a parody, but we also saw that in the real life, many many times, many uh, entrepreneurs pitched their startups around a clear purpose, a social purpose. And then we thought, wait a minute, that sounds good. Why are they doing this? And importantly, clearly they are ambitious and they are driven by this, but does it resonate with all these audiences that they are trying to speak? Meaning, does it resonate with the funders? Importantly, does it resonate for, with other people who they want to join the startup? Garrett, yeah. because you actually, you have had your own social venture. Uh, and so these guys wanted to study kind of the relationship between to what extent do you communicate a social vision and does that help you or hamper you in attracting people? From your experience, is that actually for you an interesting question? Or are you thinking like, yeah, these guys might have watched some television shows and came up with research <laughs> questions by doing it. <laughs> but in reality, this doesn't matter at all. What, what, what would be your initial feeling here? Life of an academic <laughs> owl or TV <Steve> shows. <laughs> oh, shit, Dries. So you, you will be uh, shocked to hear that I have a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> but I'll try, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be brief. Yeah, I mean, so, so Timo and Murat, uh, 10 years, 13 years ago, holy crap, I'm getting old. In, in 2010, I built my first venture-backed company, Kula.com, and it was uh, a, a enterprise software as a service with a, a clear mission to contribute a, a billion dollars a year uh, to philanthropy through corporate sources, right? So we kind of created this platform of democratized transactional giving where when you purchase Amazing. with a, a company that they would contribute to one of millions of, of causes around the world. And back then it was already a tricky time. We we're in the height of a recession, a pretty ugly one. Um, and we had a very clear social, the, the social mission was part of the DNA. It was part of the business model. And, and that probably had a little bit of an advantage that it wasn't, we weren't trying to be philanthropic. You know, the, the model was set up in a way that the more you gave, the more money that we made. So it was very transactional. And I think it had a nice rational component to it. When you talk about communicating that, I think the first thing is, is who are you communicating to, right? Murat, you mentioned communicating to investors. That was a big pain in the ass because there had yet to be, I mean, nowadays, I think there's companies like Benevity that became one of the first unicorn kind of impact giving type platforms. But even back then there were still like Facebook causes and there were a, a few smaller platforms, but nothing was really, you know, other than maybe you consider Patagonia or some of these kind of uh, sustainable companies, but there weren't really any analogs. So most investors, when you talked about a social mission, immediately thought, well, this isn't going to make any money. This is a nonprofit, essentially. Yeah. Now, when we talk about recruitment, I would say it was different at different stages of the company. Um, er early on, when when all things are equal and nobody has any money and you're trying to figure it out, it was pretty, I would say, if the founder, in this case, I was very passionate about this topic. I'd felt the pain point of it. I'd been living and breathing it for 22 months, trying to make it work on my own. And I would say it was a big differentiator in the early stage. Once we raised, you know, four or five million bucks and, and the company started to grow and we were recruiting more talent rather than the, the first early employees um, that knew exactly the risk profile they were jumping into, then it became a little bit trickier, I would say, you know, because, you know, then it was, I would say when all things were equal, when the position was the same, the salary was the same, the equity package was the same, and the company was on the similar trajectory to the alternative, we had this small level up. But with particularly with engineers, it was very, very difficult. I would say it was much, much harder. It was much easier bringing in the business folks, my comms team, my marketing team than it was my engineering team that already back then had this mercenary mindset of I'm going to the 
it, as soon as I know the equity, the ESOPs aren't going to be worth anything. I'm jumping ship and and going somewhere else. So, um, yeah. L- long story short, I would say communications go in a lot of different directions. Um, who you're communicating to makes a difference, and then what stage of the startup, I would say, um, I, I noticed a pretty significant difference. Okay, and and so let's uh, maybe go. Yeah, who else go at more sharing? Yeah. And, and uh, let, let us maybe just make that right your thought. <laughs> we have a little bit of a delay, I think. Yes, we <laughs> had a bit of a delay, but that's not a problem. Um, would that go at? Uh, exactly, Gareth. Thanks for sharing. Uh, the message depends on the audience because the audience have different aspirations. Mm-hmm. At different stages, as you have highlighted, the investors want to have extraordinary returns and employees, especially later stage employees, want to have something different. Yep, 100%. And that message will either appeal to them or repel them. What we, in this paper, uh, Timur, please feel free to jump in any time, but we show that social mission uh, content in vision communication might repel uh, employees in the recruitment stage. When we talk about human resources, there are three stages of human resources. It is recruitment, a selection, and retention. <laughs> and the more bigger the pool that you have, the easier for you to choose the right people. In this paper, we find that a social vision communication actually reduces the pool by repelling people, uh, potential job seekers, because they are looking for career advancement opportunities. They want autonomy. They want equity stakes. Mm -hmm. They want to be part of a, a rapidly growing startup. You made an important statement in your, uh, experience saying that all things being equal that can be but your message determines the fact that not everything is being perceived i'm underlining the perception part not everything is perceived to be equal when you tell about social vision unfortunately what we found in our two studies that uh, potential employees job seekers question the viability of the business question uh, the extraordinary returns they may question the autonomy they can have question the fact that do they have to be a vegetarian as well like this ceo <laughs> right M- murat timo just a, a quick question and and to clarify okay. something because my understanding of of the thesis of your paper it, it maybe wasn't about the conversion process in recruitment, but it was really the top of the funnel, right? In the kind of lead gen side of the funnel that you weren't, they weren't getting as many candidates and applicants as you move farther down the funnel that perhaps then it becomes uh, a competitive advantage, but you just the, the number of recruits were lower because of the exactly. perception of the value of, of a exactly. social venture. I, I think one thing that I want to add to what Murad's saying, um, <laughs> is is the following and that's so what would you generally expect right and this is also how we how we framed the paper initially is that what you would expect from from let's say prior research but maybe also from a common sense that we have of what large organizations are doing is that to retain people uh to convince people to come on board we want to say that we are a good organization we're an organization that uh, an organization that contributes to society that does well uh, and perhaps nowadays even larger organizations that say that they have a purpose and so a lot of research shows that this works um, there's, a, however, little research. Right? There's, a, there's an incipient, growing body of research that looks into the people that work for startups, and they, and it's the Michael Roach and, and Henry Saruman do a lot of work on this. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> awesome papers, but they really show that these are people with different characteristics from entrepreneurs and different characteristics from people that work for large organizations. And so this also informs us that probably the pool that we're looking at, the pool that we need to match up with as a small organization, as a startup, is a different pool than those people in a large organization. And so, and, and what is the taste that they have? And obviously all audience are heterogeneous, right? In the real world, things are even more complex. But 
at least for science, we have to make it slightly simpler. And we're going to say, look, if we take the pool of people that work for startups as a, as a pool with a particular taste, then what is that taste? And the reason that they sort of self-select into that labor market for startup means that they're looking for a small team for autonomy, for perhaps even learning opportunities. Let's admit that some of us would also go in there because we think that, okay, I accept a lower salary now, but maybe with the potential to yeah, you know, maybe maybe be part of this growing humongous thing. And, and the thing that the social vision is doing, it's, 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 it, apparently what we find is that it's associated, it has different associations, and therefore it tones down these associations that are common to the startup environment. And, and, and so if you then look, you know, under the hood of that little machine, then what's going on is that, okay, yes, they perceive Shit. something like value fit. So yeah, I want to work for something that has a positive impact on the world. Yeah. However, if I have to make the decision what to work for, I also want to do something that's, that's good for my career advancement. And especially in the early stages, people that work for startups are generally young. They're still looking to shape their career. And, and then this tones down also that perception of, of, yeah, you uh, of the startup as an opportunity to, let's say, move to quicker management positions, for example, or to enhance your resume or to become an entrepreneur yourself. It's uh, it, just curiously, because the way you guys are kind of explaining it, it, it almost infers that employees of startups are, are rational actors. Right. And I, I think in some ways, one could argue, at least in some contexts, that they're irrational actors, right? Because they're taking bigger risks. They don't have the stability. They don't have the security, but they are, you know, to steal from Daniel Pink, right? They're looking for these, uh, the sense autonomy, ability to achieve mastery, sense of purpose. And um, they're, they're gambling the, the compensation now for a, a future compensation that may never arise. But the way you're kind of describing it a little bit is that, in the end, in this process, at least in this context, that they're acting relatively rationally and and kind of focusing on what they perceive the potential value being rather than these maybe quality of life metrics or, or kind of softer metrics that uh, a rational actor may not consider. Uh, first of all, I think I fully agree with you. I don't think entrepreneurs are rational at all. Uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. As we mentioned in the beginning, nobody knows whether the startup will make it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows whether the business is viable or big enough. Nobody knows if the targets will be achieved. As a result, they are courageous. They dare to take uh, to that uh, onto that journey, but they know why they are on that journey. Of course, they don't have the full information, huge uncertainty. They cannot make uh, fully informed decisions. That's why they rely on the communications of entrepreneurs. And from these communications, they detect or try to make sense of uh, certain elements in the, that startup offers. That's why they uh, start that journey. And as Timo highlighted, uh, people who decide to join a startup have different motivations. They could work for a large incumbent, a corporation, where they get a steady salary, clear hierarchy, and on top of it, if they are fortunate enough to work for a purpose-driven organization, that would complement that. What happens for a startup is that startup cannot often match those perks or secure perks uh, incumbents or large corporations offer. For social ventures, however, they often offer the purpose, uh, social purpose, as a substitute instead of a complement. Mm -hmm. And as a result, what we see in our data, uh, the potential recruits, the job seekers, perceive less, uh, less opportunity for advancement. Let me be clear, uh, both Timo and I were extremely disappointed with the results. We really hoped that the reason why we started this project is that we want the world a better place. And we know uh, since Schumpeter, the world can be created by entrepreneurs. Uh, if you want to create a better place, entrepreneurs can achieve this. So we were hoping that 
that mission would bring in attract more people to join them in that mission mm-hmm. unfortunately uh, our two studies one uh, a large job board in the united states across different regions and different industry show that uh, social vision communication repels potential recruits and then we ran an experiment with our university students where we presented them two identical startups, same startups, only the job advertisement was changed. And we found that social vision communication repelled these people, but there's a good news. Let me <laughs> share this news with you as well. You can compensate with your mission, social mission message, by highlighting uh, career advancement opportunities. Mm-hmm. Let it be the salary, let it be the equity, let it be autonomy, let it be the learning opportunities explicitly in your message, then the negative effect of social vision communication forcing the disappears. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Gareth, were, were you actually expecting that? That So uh, what, what is found is that the stronger a startup kind of projects this social purpose, the less attractive the startup becomes for applicants. So these, the more they promote their social purpose, the, the less attractive they become, the less applicants they get. Mm-hmm. Were you expecting that or, or do you think it's surprising? And Murat says he's disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> That's still another way to yeah. frame it. I, I probably share that disappointment, right? We, yeah. you, you want to think that there is more of an altruistic mindset, I guess. But I think if you look at if you look at the market in general, um, and, and I think the data is pretty clear that social ventures don't raise as much venture capital as other types of businesses, which automatically put them at at a disadvantage, right? If you are a if you are a, a very rational software engineer looking for a particular trajectory or to you know to to make as much money off an exit as possible the the prospect is much worse in in that particular context so i think that part is is not particularly surprising um i would say though my experience was a little bit different and i'm an n of one so i don't want to go too deep too deep into that but i managed to pull away like ta- I pulled away the head of product from Intuit to join us. And that guy was making a massive salary and he was fed up with the corporate world that he felt lacked purpose mm. and made this shift and cut his salary in half. Obviously got more equity out of it, but had a, a pretty substantial salary cut. I would say most of my employees ended up taking big cuts to do that because they were so passionate about the purpose. There might be an issue of geography, you know, being in Boulder, Colorado, which is already a super kind of left leaning, green, sustainable type community that there is an aggregation of those types of values in in a place like that. Um, But yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised. I I would say if the data showed that, you know, a a candidate was a finalist for the job for multiple jobs and didn't choose the more social one, that would surprise me a little bit more, but I don't think that was the context of the study. So. I, I want to maybe, if I can, tie yes. into it quickly to bring a bit of nuance into this. Mm-hmm. So it is it is obviously the case that we are we are kind of we are generalizing to an audience that is the startup joiner, right? And and but this is a very this is a big audience and it's it's varied. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for future research to really go deeper into you know, yeah. for who does it work and for whom doesn't it work. And what are the various, and this is, I think, important, what's the, what are the various channels by which entrepreneurs recruit people? Because we only looked at like more conventional recruitment channels. So what, what does it mean? It means that you're trying to, to appeal to the largest possible pool that you think is going to be applicable to your organization. And in case of, I think, on average, especially if you look at the job platform uh, that we chose oh. uh, to, to take our data from, these are business people, engineers, marketeers, software engineers, not a lot of people purely focused on, let's say, the PR no. side or purely focused on sustainable strategy, right? But obviously, there's going to be a difference between these different people, between these different types. And I think 
what we want to, what, what future research might want to show, and what we su suspect is that, in essence, social entrepreneurs will maybe not even report large problems recruiting because they get people organically a lot. There is people that are interested in this. I think the thing that we show specifically is that at the interface, you have a selection problem. And that is, if you cannot recruit via the conventional channels, the largest possible pool, it will be hard to create a good match. Uh, no, we... and, but you are eventually going to find people. And uh, uh, that's for sure. And you are going to find people, a lot of people that are, I think, motivated uh, by, by impact. Um, and, it's, and like you said, particularly if there's, you know, competing jobs uh, and they've applied to them, it, my, my, my two cents would also be that they probably choose the one that has impact over the one that does not. But I think the key is to get these people to apply to the, in the first place, right? right? And, and I think that's what, where for us this nuance comes in, but also where future research should look uh, into uh, and how to, how, to, yeah, how to change that for entrepreneurs or how to help them navigate that problem. Gerrit, this uh, colleague from Intuit, how did you find them? Did you find them from the common job pool or was it a social network that you tapped? Good question. Yeah, that it was very much a social network for sure. You know, we were growing our, our local presence and, and visibility as well. And I, I would say there True. was a lot of serendipity that came out of that. It wasn't a, mm. a broad brush. I will say one thing though, when we were recruiting, especially in the later days, and, and I'm very familiar with the, the job pl platform that you guys used as well. Um, and yeah. I would maybe say that that's a very traditional or historically was a traditional tech recruitment platform, right? So yeah. you're wanting to work for a Silicon Valley startup, that's the place you were gonna mm -hmm. go. But there were other, there were some self-selection, you know, yeah. like we used, I think it was called Green Jobs or Green Biz or something like that. There were some other platforms that were really pulling a lot of the social ventures specifically that were looking for people with that specific that, focus. That, so, um, shall we give a special gift to our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> we can tell them about a study tree that is not actually in the paper. <laughs> We actually well, conducted a study tree. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Italy, mm -hmm. recruited four ventures with a social vision and four ventures with mainly profit vision. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we went to Italy is because Italy is the first European uh, uh, country uh, that uh, recognized benefit corporations, B Corps, and it has the highest numbers of social enterprises. We talked to both the CEOs and their uh, recently joined employees. First of all, what uh, we observed that the social vision startups, their CEOs relied on personal networks, family, friends. And that was not a deliberate choice, by the way. That was the outcome because they couldn't find people, sufficient number of people from regular uh, recruitment channels. Yeah. Whereas that wasn't a problem for the uh, for-profit for profit, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And second thing, we also observed that the employees uh, share this common profile that Timo highlighted. They want to learn, they want to grow, uh, they want autonomy and they want to be in a successful business. Mm -hmm. And many of them told us that if they realize this is not going in that direction, as Gerrit, you said in the regarding your own startup, they told us that they jump shell. They will jump ship. Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, it's very, 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 very interesting to kind of. Actually, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on that. I want to get, get that. <laughs> a lot together. of thoughts are going through your head, man. <laughs> I think I'm having a little bit of flashbacks here. Well, I, yeah, well, all these studies on the <laughs> <laughs> what, what I wanted to just I just remembered what I wanted to say, but um, we had a terrible, terrible luck with tech recruiters. So we used tech recruitment firms quite a bit for our engineering teams. And we're willing to pay, you know, in the U.S., that's 20% of a year salary. So that was, you know, 20, 20 to 30 grand per per head. And the the amount of candidates that we would get from those recruiters were almost nil. 
when we when we did it ourselves through LinkedIn, pushed it through local networks, you know, kind of went word of mouth, we did have much better. And maybe this comes back a little bit to not just the channel of communication, but who is communicating it and who is the person and is there I mean, I found that I could I was a pretty good recruiter because it was my baby and it was my story and my narrative. And when I told that story, you know, my life was built into it as well. If I, if I basically outsource that storytelling to a recruiter, it kind of, maybe it took a little bit of the magic away from it and, and that kind of watered it down and made it less impactful. I don't know. Do, do you guys think the, do you think that could have something to do with it as well? Definitely. And I think one of the reasons for that is that that the recruiter knows the audience probably better than you do. And so it will be watered down. I mean, you don't want that. And, and it, it, the fact that you don't want that is, is good. I mean, you're the owner, uh, you're the one that sets the strategic direction. And I think it was our job with this paper to show you as this founder of a purpose driven organization, what the consequence of that is. So it's a purposeful choice that you can make. Okay, I see what the consequence will be. I'll let it go. I'll let the rec recruiter take charge. <laughs> um, uh, if I want to go through conventional channels, enlarge my pool, particularly, for example, for technical or business oriented people uh, or not. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that you actually, I mean, going into a podcast like this, the fact that you actually have experienced this is, is really cool for us also, because, you know, with science, you know how it is. Sometimes hey, you, you do so much to make sure that what you find works, but if it it, it's so essential that it keeps resonating, right? Um, so that's nice. I like that. Um, I can share a quote from one of our interviewees uh, based on what you have just said. Uh, the startup is called uh, Andelia, and the employee told us that she did some interviews and the best one, the one that convinced her was Francesca, her current boss. Just the way she answered the phone call and the story she told, uh, she, she felt something and the company is amazing. See, for like, but as you said, uh, this personal touch, personal story actually can make a difference. Uh, going back to circling back to what we initially said, uh, when the startup is just words, the person, it matters who utters those words and how they say those words. Right. Yeah. And that's unfortunately the big challenge, right? Is everything fails at scale. So when you're, when you're a small team of eight, 10, 12, sort of. 15, you know, even when we were 20, 25, okay. I could still do that. Right. But there's a, there's a limit. And, you know, we talk with a lot of founders on this podcast and, and, you know, the big lesson that we often talk about is, you know, the founders can't scale themselves. Right. The company has to scale around them. And oftentimes the founder is so central to the narrative, to the mission in the early stage. But at some point, the the you know, the the company needs to matriculate past that one center of gravity. So what happens as the company gets bigger, it has to be the kind of collective story that's gonna gonna recruit that talent. And I think that's you know, maybe in the early stages, the founder can have all that passion and it can be really effective to, to get people in. But as soon as you take that person out of the equation, posting it on a job board, posting it online where you have limited characters, like you're not going to get, you're not going to get that magic that, that comes along with it. So, and I think, very, did, and I, yeah. I'll just say one other thing that's really, you know, as someone that was a, a social venture founder <laughs> in times when there weren't many, and now certainly are, are more. It's very, very difficult to get information about the collective experience. That's why I found you guys' paper so interesting because I work with hundreds of founders a year. I maybe get a handful, you know, that are actual social ventures that are able to raise enough capital and, you know, get to product market fit. So, you know, seeing this experience with, I think, okay. what was your final data set? You had like, you narrowed it down to like seven or 800, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Is that right? That's yeah, about so. pretty pretty incredible to to see that experience across so many of them yeah because cool. maybe yeah. touch a bit more about this kind of what are actually the implications of your research for practitioners so are you guys as you mentioned you have you have done actually several research proce uh, project on on this topic of communication strategies of of startups um 
And actually, I think we on the podcast, Gareth, we have talked about this more at uh, the importance of communication strategy and that a lot of startups don't pay a lot of attention to it. We talked with Oliver Aust and Jack Singh about that. Um, so uh, Murat and Timo, if you guys talk with startups based on your research, what kind of recommendations do you give them in terms of their communication strategies? So it's a very good question, right? And, and, and it varies, I think, a little bit with regards to uh, the, the aspect of, of the audience that we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. are, I mean, are you talking about an early stage investment audience? Are you talking about impact investors or regular investors? Uh, are you talking about job seekers? Are you talking about technical ones, business-oriented ones, et, et cetera? So one thing that I think we can learn over over the project is is first and foremost, you need to understand who your audience is and uh, what they, well, I don't say want to hear, but how they will probably respond to what you're going to say and what they are looking for. Right. So why are they engaging with you and how are they, uh, why are you engaging with them and, and what could that lead to? Uh, that's, and, and obviously, you know, that, that is, it's a bit of an open door, but that is kind of what it is. It, it just shows that, and I think what our research specifically shows is that Things that you think you need to do as a founder, having a vision and, and going forward into the world and drive change. And obviously, I agree. Great, right? We need that. But you, you should be aware of the nuances of that and the boundary conditions of that. That uh, choosing a particular identity or choosing a particular way of, 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 of presenting yourself to the world can affect how these audiences respond also in ways that you do not want. <laughs> and, and I think that's, yeah. that's the core learning. So we're not saying uh, you should not be social. We're not saying you should not be disruptive. Uh, we're not saying that you should not emphasize, you know, growth or anything. <laughs> we're saying, you know, be yourself, be authentic, but be aware of the audience and and what how it affects them, uh, uh, and, and and how that could affect your outcomes. Uh, and so as to maximize your own chances, I think that will be at a high level my my recommendation. Uh, uh, exactly. So to be clear, we want more social ventures. We want more people preach social purpose. We want more entrepreneurs to change the world. As Timo highlighted, uh, they just need to be aware that that message may resonate differently across different audiences. We are not saying that they should become like politicians and tell different things to different audiences. Instead, be yourself, be authentic, be aware of the the drawbacks of that message, and if you can, remedy this. Our paper for, tells a way to do that. It says, please continue communicating with social vision, but at the same time, highlight the uh, career advancement opportunities that uh, recruits can enjoy at your company, so that you do not leave room for interpretation you do not leave room for false perceptions that undermine your ability to attract those people. I really like this message from you guys. One thing we talk about quite a bit is is message market fit. You know, this, <laughs> beautiful. We think so much about product market fit, but message market fit. I think you know Oliver Oust actually was the one that kind of shared that term with me for the first time, and and it immediately struck a chord. I remember when we were raising our, our seed round, so it was our second round of investment, and I was talking to so many different types of investors, right? From big VCs to corporate venture capital to angel syndicates to, to social venture funds. And I realized that, you know, I think a lot of founders, they put so much work into their story that they think it's now this one size fits all approach. And it took a, a very few quick failures to realize that I needed a different, basically a different deck and a different narrative for all of these different personas. So we kind of treated, treated the investor pool like we treated customers, like we created these personas, defined them, and then tailored our message to each one of them. So you know, the social venture uh, funds wanted to really understand what the impact was going to be. But the traditional VC funds were really wanting to understand what are the unit economics behind this, how you make money. So even though our story was essentially the same, the spin was so fundamentally different that if you took the logos out, you may think that they were different <laughs> businesses. But in the end, we were telling the same story. We were just trying to meet people where they are and understand what their objectives are. And I think that's just something that inexperienced founders, myself included at that time, 
had to suffer the pain point to realize. And I think I still have at least a dozen different decks that I would just switch out the, the audience for to send out just to, and that's why I would say, you know, whether you're recruiting talent or you're trying to find investors, it's almost, it's 80% research and 20% execution. It's really like understand the person that you're communicating with. So you know how to reach them most effectively. I, I recognize this. I, so I worked for a startup for one and a half years. I told you, I, I told you guys about that at the beginning. And so I was head of operations, which, you know, at a startup, you know what that means. You know, you do everything that the founders don't want to do. Um, <laughs> recruit people, people, HR, finance, making sheets, called that sheet management, uh, but also draft pitch decks together with the founders. Uh, I remember distinctly that you know, the founders were always working on racing the next round, always working because it was a consumer electronics product. So very heavy on the development and investment side to, to get the product you know, on the market. Um, and I remember so well that we would go to these venture capitalists and yeah, they, were, they, they would they would ask the first question and I was like, yeah, that's not really in our deck, right? And that's because we were so oblivious, actually. If I now if I now talk about this, like we were so I was so oblivious uh, about this. Uh, so it's really I, 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 yeah, I find it also very interesting that you have this experience where you actually learned this in a in a good way. Where where now that I realize it, looking back, it's like how why did we do it that way? Why would we have only one pitch deck and and one go to market strategy? Like, all these uh, investors want to hear something different, right? Look, it's a lot of freaking work, right? Yeah, and you, you're always feeling behind and you're just trying to keep your head above water. So, you know, all founders want to do, like I've, we always talk about you wear 10 different hats and all you're doing is trying to find a way to take one of those hats and, and give them away to someone else, right? Or 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 put it away. And, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult, but it's amazing when your back is against the wall and you're worried how you're going to pay your employees in, in a month, yeah. um, what you're willing to do to to try to get it right. You know, so mm. that's why we have mentors, so we can, so other people can learn from my fuck ups. I can share with them what I did wrong. <laughs> Maybe an, an, a related question. So we now talked a bit about recommendations to entrepreneurs. I'm also curious about how you integrate the the findings of your research in your teaching, because I suppose both of you are teaching students that often have the ambition to become an entrepreneur. And so what you find in your research is that how you communicate really matters, can have positive effects, but also negative effects. So, so how do you use this kind of insights in your teaching? How do you learn your students to become better communicators when they create a startup or a venture? Any examples of how you use that? Tino, go ahead. I can start with the models. I'm also, yeah, I'm also a student myself, right? <laughs> so I use my own research to create the, the story that I tell in front of the class. When I teach executives or when I teach master students, the first question I ask, why are they in that classroom? Mm. Yeah. And how do they want to leave that classroom? And I try to come up, uh, not come up, but create a storyline based on the materials that I want to cover to fill that gap so that I take those students from the beginning to make sure that they leave the classroom the way they, they want to leave the classroom. And as a result, as Gerrit said, I teach differently to master students than I teach the executives. Yeah. I can only, I can only agree with that. I think as a modern teacher, uh, you want to use your teaching methods and tools in a way that um, speaks to <laughs> your audience. And, and that means knowing your audience and that differs very much between the level that they're at, right? Um, uh, <laughs> just to give an example, right? with master students, I tend to be much more mature. I try to, uh, for example, give them much more autonomy in terms of how they learn, for example, through a flipped classroom principle. Um, I don't specifically teach about re uh, startup recruitment and building a venture, uh, but for example, I do teach about research. And one of the things that I that I do there is I try to to give them, let's say, plenary material in a way that gives them autonomy mm -hmm. and that makes them feel like somebody uh, that is already right. skilled and is trying to work towards uh, something on their own. Exactly. And then in the classroom itself, I can make it contextual for them because even year by year, how the group responds to the plenary material just 
differs. And so then right. in the offline class, I have the opportunity to interact with them and to practice. And we, and you know, we as scientists here, we know that sometimes you know science can be boring for students or hard, or there's so much to learn. Uh, and it's a bit of an apprenticeship, not something that you can just you know say like do it this this this, and then you have a research, you have like a paper. So here I really try to sort of make sure that they have the opportunity to work with it and to experience it and then to adjust the, to their questions and the things that they are struggling with in their research questions, so to say. This is the example that I have. It's not necessarily okay. entrepreneurship, but it is a way of adjusting to the audience. Yeah. Dries, what I what I hear from this is what you and I were talking about on one of the last episodes of, you know, maybe right, I think we kind of built this podcast a little bit with the the dichotomy between academia and entrepreneurship. And I think what we've been finding over what 81, 82 episodes now is there's a much narrower gap than we actually maybe started off thinking. And especially I would say with with younger 21st century academics, you guys clearly are taking the customer into account, taking the student into account, trying to meet them where they are and and constantly evolving your tools and your processes to become more effective because the market essentially is always changing for you mm -hmm. guys. And I think if you maybe talk to our parents or generations before us, <laughs> it probably wasn't that much that way. So um, that's probably my guess. Maybe it's just our discipline and we're just a bunch of innovative folks, but I, I do feel like this entrepreneurial mindset is permeating academia more and more than before. Would you guys agree with that? Completely. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also for instance, the topic about chase, chasing after funding, it's also a topic that <laughs> academics are very familiar with. So uh, startup founders might chase after VC funding and we are chasing after research funding uh, and also juggling that kind of responsibility with all the other responsibilities, I think is very similar to what is happening in a startup. So I, I fully agree with you, Garrett, that the more and more we talk with different people, the more and more we see the parallels between being an uh, academic and entrepreneur than the differences, which, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had one final question because, of course, if we talk about social ventures or also sustainability-driven ventures, and we often also hear the, the, the concept of greenwashing, or I would say social impact washing, our startups pretend to be having a social purpose or... Um, uh, I, I watched the, um, the latest uh, presentation of Sam Altman of OpenAI, and I had the feeling there was some uh, social purpose watching going on in that presentation, to be honest. Um, so can you s could you see that that influences the findings that you found? Because in the end, uh, you're really looking at communication strategies. So it's like, how is a startup communicating about their purpose, which can be different about, is that really the purpose that they have? You can communicate that you're a social venture, but that doesn't mean that you're necessarily that you really are a social venture. In your research, did you, in one way or another, came across that topic, or is is it something that? And because of course, in the paper, you are very clear that you're focusing on communication strategies, so that's very clear. Yep. But but I was thinking, okay, would it be interesting to make this distinction between what startups communicate and how they really behave? I think that's an important research gap we don't address mm -hmm. uh, in this paper. The intuition will say if the uh, rec recruits don't find the startup or the CEO authentic, they would leave. I only uh, anecdotal evidence saying that they may this may not be the case all the time. Mm -hmm. Think about Terranos. Clearly, it was a fraud. Chief scientist officer knew that, but stayed alone and at the end committed suicide. There are many companies where maybe then we are in a different realm that we need to talk about not only authenticity, but also the charisma that they create this field, entrepreneurs create this field around them, making uh, it harder for recruits to escape from. I don't know, but I'm, my hand says that there is no straightforward answer here. It can go either way. I think well, the only thing I want to add, because I think Murad uh, captured this 
almost perfectly. But one thing that I do want to add is that, again, this depends so much on the audience that we need future research for. It depends so much on how you interpret particular cues. Uh, what I might find credible in terms of, an, of, 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 say, claimed impact or claimed goal might sound as hogwash to you. And I, I think that's, that, that's so much nuance that we couldn't mm -hmm. capture that, that specific idea. Right. Yeah, I, I, I want to throw one other research gap that I think would be really interesting as well, because and, and it comes a little bit from my previous experience, but also from I'm a lot of founders I work with now. <laughs> uh, hopefully, maybe I don't know what the hell I'm talking about either. But the, specifically, the difference between recruiting engineering teams, technical <laughs> talent, and non-technical talent. And I think it's particularly interesting in today's age Hi. where we're seeing social impact ventures that are also deep tech, mm. right? Because when you think of the recruitment mm. of engineers and many of my engineer friends will say, I don't care as much about the purpose of the company. I care a lot about the engineering challenge, right? And my purpose comes from solving complex technical problems, right? So, you know, what happens in the context where you maybe you have a social impact venture that is also, you know, deep learning or, you know, quantum or, or something along those lines where now you have kind of two purposes and two missions that are attracting two different types of folks, right? So I think when you segment, when you segment the recruits, there's probably a different value. I would hypothesize there might be a different value set among the t the engineers versus among among the business folks but now we're seeing companies that offer both of those things yes. which could be an interesting thing to explore 100 percent fully yeah. agree maybe maybe beyond that and I, I think also one one additional step is we do not we do not know right and our research cannot cover that yet but maybe in the future who knows what happens after this after the initial recruitment stage so what happens in the selection and retention stages and uh Obviously, the effect of, of a social vision might be completely different, uh, but 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 there are complexities there, right? For example, the retention stage we just talked about. For example, the founder and uh, how much the presence of the founder and the personal conveying of that that vision or mission might actually uh, impact the audience. So, in the retention stage, all those things come in. It's not only uh, um, uh, whether or not it permeates the culture of the organization, but it's also how people live it in their daily work and how the founder keeps on emphasizing that. And maybe even if people find out whether or not they actually believe in that vision or not as they work there. Um, so, I think there's a lot of opportunities there in the future to to investigate that. Yeah, it reminds me. I recently watched the, the documentary on Netflix about the company Jewel. So the vaping company mm. that became uh, mm. a unicorn. And so what they nicely show in the documentary is that these guys, when they started, they really were kind of a uh, purpose-driven company. And the purpose was we want to help uh, addicted cigarette smokers to get rid of the, the nasty cigarettes and give them a much more healthier option, namely vaping. And in, by <laughs> promoting that social vision, they attracted a lot of young people that were really living for that vision. But then over time, because of the, the investment logic, actually one of the biggest tobacco companies became their core shareholder. And that created a huge clash between, on the one hand, the shareholders that clearly did not have the ambition to uh, replace smokers, but that had the ambition to create a new audience, namely young people getting them addicted to vaping. And the employees who had entered the company with a very different vision and that actually contributed to the total collapse of that company. So I think yeah. uh, it's like you watch Silicon Valley to get inspiration for this paper. Maybe you can watch the documentary to get the inspiration for your next uh, hope science paper or whatever you want to publish. Yeah, okay. I think, yeah, I think it touches upon also what happens when 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 an organization develops over time, right? It, it, yeah. You know, if you get an investment and and yeah, it's just it's so interesting. But. Okay, guys, I, I think it was clear that, that we could continue talking for even much longer, but I think also given the time, we, we have to come to an ending. And as you might know, we always end with asking our uh, guests for some suggestions about podcasts that they recently listened to, books that they read, or papers. Um, so, Murat, can I give you the floor first to give a suggestion for something that you uh, want to share with our audience? 
Uh, yes, sure. One of my favorites is Ethan Mollick's The Unicorn's Shadow. It's a very, uh, it's a tiny book, extremely well written, and it gives evidence-based guidelines for entrepreneurs. And the other book I would recommend is uh, Ron Adner's Winning the Right Game. Okay. Uh, we kept uh, highlighting the importance of product market fit meaning that you need to tune your story, your product, your message for the customer. But actually for entrepreneurs, the customer is not the only target. They are embedded in an ecosystem with multiple stakeholders. And this book, I think he was also in your podcast recently yeah. as well, highlights that they need to look at, uh, entrepreneurs need to look at the broader ecosystem and need to build strategies to align those different stakeholders. Yeah, yeah I remember that Gareth Sorry. had quite an intensive discussion with Ron about <laughs> the, this book. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, Timo, go ahead. So uh, I, I, I must admit something here as an academic is that uh, I think I read enough nonfiction in my work. So in my daily life, I don't read nonfiction right. because I get bored. It's like I, I only Fair read enough. fiction and I could talk an hour about all the science fiction books that I love, but I just refer you to the sci-fi masterworks series. Just read them all. It's perfect. But <laughs> one thing that I think the audience might like, um, and maybe somebody discovered this already. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't listened to all your podcasts. I've listened to a couple, uh, but so the revolutions podcast by Mike Duncan. So Mike Duncan is a guy that made originally the history of Rome podcast. And then he started the revolutions podcast. And I like it. First of all, because sometimes I fall asleep with it. <laughs> I fall asleep, <laughs> call. Sometimes I go running and then I listen to the podcast, but it's interesting because what it covers, it covers all the revolution that he thinks are relevant revolutions in our modern Western society and how they developed. And I think it actually, it's, it's a bit political, but for me, it served also as a way of understanding where we are right now and how we got here. And, and just in a broader sense, it doesn't have to do anything with, with entrepreneurship per se, but it just has to get a better sense of why are we currently at war with Russia, maybe? Or why are we, uh, why is our society the way shaped that it is shaped? And there are so many things that, that come come to pass by. And yeah, it's, cool. I like I like that. Yeah. I keep thinking of that me that meme that says, "How often do you think about the Roman Empire?" I don't know if you guys have been seeing that, but <laughs> like every day, every day, but every day. awesome. Great. Okay, Murat, Timo, thanks a lot for being here. This was actually a new experiment to invite two professors to talk for one hour about an academic paper. So it was also for us an experiment. Dries just wanted I... to outnumber me, I think, this time. That's why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but at least from my side, I think it was a very successful experiment. So thanks a lot for being here, for sharing your thoughts, not only about the paper, but, but also in a broader perspective. So I think that was very interesting. And of course, I also hope that our audience has enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to the audience actually also for listening. I just noticed that we crossed our 40,000 downloads. So that's getting increasingly popular. So nice to see some traction. Uh, nice to see that we get some fan base. Um, so we hope you enjoy it, that you continue to enjoy it, that you continue to listen to us. And we look forward to the next episode that will be published in two weeks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank okay. you.